Nadia Manzur has a complex, an identity complex, that is, but she's determined to get a few laughs out of her own awkward personal melting pot. Born into a conservative Pakistani family and raised in rural England, Nadia was caught between two cultures and she struggled with that conflict all her life until she moved to New York and was allowed to be herself. The result? An autobiographical one-woman show, which incidentally resonates deeply right now as the world confronts the brutality of ISIS, especially to women. It's called Burkhoff, and after performing for sold-out crowds across the United States, she's finally brought it back home to London, where she joined me here on the set. Nadia, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. For a conservative Pakistani girl growing up in rural England, yes. was comedy eventually an escape for you? I don't know if it was an escape. It was more of uh, a, a tool that allowed me to be able to look into my past and my culture with a sense of lightheartedness that allowed me to look at difficult things like, you know, dogmatism and traditional thinking and, you know, patriarchal oppression and all that kind of thing with a lighthearted approach that allowed me to tell the story that wasn't very heavy and, you know, burdensome. And it gave me a liberating, um, it gave me a liberating approach into looking at my story. Well, let's now play one of the clips from your one-woman show precisely about that early uh, impact that the patriarchal system had on you. You wanted to be an astronaut. This is what happened when you told your family. Yeah. Nita, how can you be astronaut? Are hmm? women can't be astronauts. Hmm? Who will cook? <laughs> Who will clean? Who will feed your husband if you are floating about in space? <laughs> I mean, it's funny. Yeah. Did it really happen like that? Is that exactly what your father said to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, my father, from the earliest that I can remember, reminded me that I shouldn't get fat. I shouldn't eat too many French fries because my inherent purpose would be jeopardized, which is to be a wife and a mother, right? And, um, but I was fascinated by space, and I was fa as all kids are, right, fascinated by the unknown, and I wanted to explore, and I understood that as being an astronaut. The inherent purpose, as you say, was to become a wife and a mother. Yeah. On the one hand, that's not so different from what many young girls mm -hmm. 30 or odd years ago mm -hmm. were, were expected to be. On the other hand, how was it actually growing up in the heart of England under that kind of conservative foreign kind of, of life. Sure. Deeply confusing. I had a real struggle throughout my life with my identity and who I was and where my moral compass and integrity would come from, you know? My values that were being described to me in my home were very much about how the white person and the English person was the other, was a sinner. We shouldn't become like them. But at the same time, I was sent to an English school for the education. So there was this confusing thing, which was like, you know, my, pa my parents came here for the freedoms but yet they weren't fully able to embrace those freedoms. So when you were at this school, yeah. uh, you rebelled, I suppose. And I also read that you kind of lied yeah. about who you were and where you came from. I started lying from a really early age. So I would lie to my white friends about, you know, where we went on holiday. I didn't want to tell them I went to Karachi and drank lassi and, you know, peed in a hole in the ground toilet. Um, and I would lie about my name. My brother's name was Horam, and I would say his name was Kevin. But, you know, whereas to my parents, I would lie about the kind of things I was learning at school. Or if my friends talked about boys, or, you know, when I eventually got a boyfriend at 18, I, I, everything was hidden, you know, because so much um, inherent in the Pakistani uh, ideology is what other people think of you. And your family's honor is the most important thing. So I could never do anything that was dishonorable to my family. But at the same time, all of my friends were doing all of these things that, you know, as just a person who wanted to, to be accepted and normalized in her environment, I couldn't do. You have sold out in all your sort of appearances, yeah. whether it's across the United States and here in London. It's yeah. going on right now. Yeah. What did your family say? Do they know what you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> so my father is a completely transformed human being. He went from a very kind of oppressive, uh, patriarchal, domineering Muslim man to a feminist to a spiritual, evolved person who recognizes that we're all here as equals, that, you know, um, has become one of my biggest fans and supporters, comes to all the shows, and is able to see himself through the show in a light that I think has made him reflect on his past 
and you know be like I was that person but I'm not that anymore thanks to my daughter you said you used to visit Karachi I don't know whether you still go to Pakistan but obviously yeah. there is a deep conflict in society there particularly when it comes to to young girls to women mm -hmm. blasphemy laws you know they're often misused to settle scores I just talked to a filmmaker Jamie Duran mm. who done a film about young boys and before young girls <clears throat> you know they are obviously very abused many of them out there mm. and he says a lot of the dysfunction in a place like Pakistan is because women aren't free and empowered mm -hmm. do you agree um, I think that within a patriarchal context anywhere in the world uh, where the emphasis is on the woman being quiet not heard her opinions don't matter her voice is silenced that that is inherently part of the part of the issue because women are objectified and therefore continued um, seen as separate beings and so violence abuse talking to them in a different way happens I mean that's just kind of the the science of objectification mm -hmm. right and here in in England people have been shocked by an old sex trafficking ring that's been exposed right 1400 white girls yeah. preyed upon by mostly Pakistani or Asian men yeah and people have been afraid to talk about it yeah. especially about the sort of multicultural ethnic religious aspect to it what's your take on that I just I feel very conflicted because I think that you know one of the things that I grew up in is a very sexually repressed environment so we didn't speak about sex we didn't talk about you know things that are very normalized and as a result I feel like in sexually repressed communities these kind of pathologies arise as we know in the Catholic religion as we know in all it's, no, it's not just a Muslim problem I think it's to do with repression and so I feel and then you know also this whole this whole idea of seeing other as separate so the white person as other sinner this whole idea of separation breeds this kind of conflict of us fighting them mm -hmm. so I think that it's you know indicative of what happened in in uh, Rotterdam and what you're speaking of um, and us just this whole battle mentality of us versus them we're actually all in this together as human beings and I think that's the biggest thing that we need to shift into Nadia Mansour thank you very much indeed for joining us thank you for having me